Welcome back, Math 170. We are looking at section 3.5 and 3.6 in the same lecture. Um, I chose to do this because um, we're not really getting rid of our, our TI anytime soon. So when we do curve sketching, we would expect that you would have it to justify some of your, your answers. And it, it's a great way to check. Now, what we're looking at, I'm going to pick out a few examples um, that are quite interesting. Sometimes they're not so straightforward. And then what I'm going to be looking at is uh, maybe starting off with a review of um, what the guidelines would be in order to curve sketch and analyze your graphs. So um, starting off with going over the domain, um, you, you're kind of paying attention to what type of function you would have. Uh, we'll be dealing with polynomials, rational functions, radical functions, and all of your studies kind of give you an idea of how to look for the domain based on what type of function you have. So we'll hit those up in a couple of the examples. Um, we're going to look at intercepts. A lot of times those are kind of very popular. So just kind of a, a, a review just in case we haven't found them in a long time. Um, if you're going to look to find the intercepts, uh, we're going to go with um, basically setting each variable equal to zero first. So I'm going to start off with setting x equal to zero, and then when you um, set x equal to zero, you're going to find your y. And that, my friends, is the y-intercept. And just do the other way around. Set your y equal to zero, and then you're going to find your x. And you probably guessed it, that's your x-intercept. Or there may be more than one x-intercept, so we're going to have to look into that. And a lot of times as I'm going through these guidelines, what I'll do is if I find a clear point or a clear characteristic of the graph, I will sketch it right away instead of waiting till the very end. So it kind of builds your graph as you go. So um, also something to kind of look out for uh, symmetry kind of helps us understand. Um, it look, make, might be a little easier to plot points that you don't have to plot so many if, if you know that you're symmetric um, with respect to the y-axis or the origin. Once you find a point on one side or the other, you can always graph the other point. So you guys remember the, the checking point. If you want to check if a function is even, um, it's helpful to understand if you're symmetric about the y-axis. And then also, um, if you're an odd function, then you'd be symmetric about the origin. So that's kind of nice to kind of have an idea of what to expect. And there's also functions that are periodic, and we've been dealing a lot with uh, trig functions. So that's kind of one way you might look for, just in case. Um, but y'all probably already know that it's a trig function, just by given the graph. If you see sine, cosine, tangent, you'll have an idea. So um, one thing we could also look for if we end up having a rational function um, or maybe one of the exponential perhaps, um, you could have horizontal asymptotes, vertical asymptotes, and slant or oblique asymptotes. And we have some, some techniques from our pre-calculus courses um, that if you are looking at a rational function, and you're trying to tell who the horizontal asymptote is, and by the way, horizontal asymptote, that would be a line that's y equals a constant, um, you could probably tell by comparing the degree of the numerator with the degree of the denominator, and that's a way to, to do this, but we're going to look at proving it using calculus because we are in the calculus class. So I'm gonna review with you um, a little bit about asymptotes from the last section. If you're a horizontal asymptote, what you do is you look at the function and you take the limit as x approaches infinity. And if you end up getting a constant, then that is what your horizontal asymptote is. And it could also be the other way around. Um, if you wanted to take the limit as x approaches negative infinity, Kind of depends on um, what's easier maybe or uh, the format of your graph. 
um, you get the idea that, that you could have a horizontal asymptote if you actually find a constant or a real number. So also, along with asymptotes, we talk about vertical asymptotes. And uh, we've found them in pre-calculus. A lot of times you're just looking at what makes the denominator zero, assuming you don't have a hole that, that, that you already see. Um, so a lot of times we can tell what it is. And I'll point that out maybe in the next example, maybe example two or so, or maybe example three, I forgot, but we'll find out soon. Um, but remember, vertical asymptotes, vertical lines always have x equaling a number. And um, we're going to prove it by using calculus by taking limits again. But this time you're taking the limit of your function as x approaches a particular number from the left. And it could be positive or negative infinity. Or you could also look at the other way around. Um, the limit as x approaches the number from the right side um, of your function. And again, it could also be positive or negative infinity, depending on what you get. So that'll give you a heads up that the line x equals c is a vertical asymptote. And what I like about using limits to find the vertical asymptote is that it does give you the behavior of the function. So it tells you if it's shooting up really high to positive infinity or shooting down really low to negative infinity. So it does give you a little more information than knowing oh, x equals c is a vertical asymptote. So we'll try to explore that. And then um, with slant and oblique, or, or it's the same thing, asymptotes, um, usually remember that it's a line um, when they talk about slant. Um, usually you have the asymptote in the form of a line y equals mx plus b. And we generally use division um, to find the limit as x approaches uh, positive or negative infinity. And um, what you're doing is you're using division on your rational function and you'll get a different format. And we'll see that also today. Okay, uh, so then now we, we jump into a little more of the calculus that we've been studying for the um, previous part of the chapter. Uh, we talk about um, identifying your intervals of increase and decrease. So just a little review on that. Uh, whenever you want to do that, you're looking for your critical numbers. And then critical numbers occur when your function uh, derivative, the first derivative is either equal to zero or it's undefined. And then once you find your critical numbers, you're basically going to test your derivative um, on each side of your critical number. And you're going to determine the sign, and that's going to help you understand, are we increasing, are we decreasing for the function f? OK. Uh, also, uh, along with part e and part f kind of go hand in hand. If you're already finding intervals of increase and decrease, um, using the first derivative test probably is the way to go. Remember, if you're already using part E to find those increase and decrease, you, you, don't, you already have that. So you know if you're going from increase to decrease. Um, that's kind of a, an idea of the function behaving in this manner. So that's going to tell you that your function evaluated at your critical number is a local max. And then the other way around, if you go from decreasing to increasing, kind of gives you an idea that your function evaluated at that critical number or critical point um, is a local min. And you know, if you have your TI you'll, and you see it on your screen, you'll probably also be able to guess this. Um, but in our class, we're doing our best to prove and I analyze the function using calculus. So this might have to be part of the work you'd show to back that up. You know, even if you are using your TI to find your, your local mins and local maxes. Um, so we could also use the second derivative test, by the way. Um, we, we'll probably see that a little bit more in 3.7. Um, but a lot of times when you're already finding 
the um, intervals of increase and decrease, you can you can pretty much, uh, I, I usually never hit this up unless it's really nice for me to find that second derivative. Um, but just in case, if you want to review, um, second derivative test works the way when you take the second derivative and evaluate it at that, that critical number. Um, if you get a negative, then that tells you there's a local max on the function at that point. And then the other way around, if you get a positive number, you end up having a local min. So just in case you want to review or put this all in one place to study, it's great. So some things that you can't see by using your TI or you can't, it might be a little hard to analyze is um, concavity and points of inflection. Um, we can have an idea of what the concavity might be, but we'll actually find precise intervals. So uh, remember when we're doing that, this has to do with the second derivative. And when you set it equal to zero, and then you find your, your C, you would then just test your second derivative on each side of that particular x value. And kind of reminds us if, we're, if we have a change in concavity, then we know we have an inflection point. Uh, so that's something that we would probably definitely have to show. And so for the most part, um, these guidelines kind of help you give good, a good idea of how to sketch the curve. A lot of times when I, once I find all these important parts on my particular graph, um, like I told you, I sketch them as I go. And then it kind of gives me a good idea of what the function is going to behave like. And then of course, you're going to use your TI to verify. Um, so as you're going through um, the homework from 3.5, um, they're assuming that you don't use a calculator to find values, and that's fine. Um, you'll find that the, the um, derivatives and everything comes out really nice for section 3.5. Um, and then when you go to 3.6, you'll have some issues because the functions aren't as friendly. And so you're kind of using your TI to justify some of the analyzing that we're, we're dealing with with these guidelines. So I'm going to switch everything up. So just so that you have an idea of how to approach everything. Um, we're going to look at example one, and they're, they're identifying us or they're telling us we want to use the guidelines to sketch. So we're going to have to address all of the items that we mentioned um, earlier. And it is true, you could punch this into your TI and we can do this right now just so we can see. Um, I do know just by looking at it that my, my f of x, it's a polynomial. Generally, I'm, I'm happy if I have a polynomial because I know the derivatives are going to be nice to take. Um, but I do know a little bit of pre-calculus. I can, I can analyze what's going on. Um, so um, they didn't mention this in these guidelines, but from our past, um, if you know who the leading term is in your polynomial, um, that is the term that has the highest power of x. In our case, the leading term is negative 2x to the sixth. Um, you could tell two things about this leading term. It gives you an idea of what the degree of the entire polynomial is. And so if you're looking at the degree being six, and if you know you have an even degree, then it gives you an idea about endpoint behavior, or sometimes they call it long run behavior. Uh, so kind of tells you what happens um, as X approaches positive infinity or as X approaches negative infinity. Where is the graph going? Is it shooting up to infinity? Is it shooting down to negative infinity? Um, so I already know from the endpoint behavior, um, having an even degree means you're either going to have your graph um, point the same directions. So it's up, up, or down, down. So I already kind of know what's happening at the edges. Um, what could also justify, you know, which one do I choose? You could also look at the fact that you have a negative leading term. 
So that gives you an idea that if it's a negative leading term, that would tell us that our polynomial is end up going to be having um, down, down endpoint behavior, long run behavior, long term behavior. So I already kind of have an idea that it, it might have um, something interesting happening in the middle, but the edges will both point down. So I always found that really useful. Um, one of the things that stuck out and, and people don't always emphasize it, but it's nice. We do have our TI though. And I would like to graph it just so that you guys can see what I'm looking at. It looks friendly when, I, when I'm just looking at this f of x. So let's see if I can pull that up for you. And we're going to clear out our old stuff. And so um, if we're going to type in for y1, negative 2x to the 6th plus 5x to the 5th. plus 140x cubed minus 110x squared. And I'll just double check. Did I enter everything correctly? If I'm off by a sign or an exponent, then that throws off my entire problem. So I'll graph it. And I see I'm on the standard window. And I have an idea um, uh, of what it could look like. Um, I, I think I'm going to have to adjust the window a little bit to see um, the higher part of the function. Um, but I'm kind of seeing that it, it appears that the way it was graphed, it looks like um, the down downs are already in the, the range of the x min and the x max. Um, but we're going to explore um, what our TI tells us and what our what our calculus tells us, because that might help us out with the window. And yeah, we, we've done this in, in uh, pre-calc college algebra. We can adjust the window eventually and find the, the nice curve and, 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 and see, but I'll wait a little bit. So let's go back. Okay. Um, what I probably might want to do, there's a couple ways to, to play with this. Um, if I'm remi reminding myself of a polynomial, um, if you are a polynomial, your domain automatically is negative infinity to positive infinity. So we don't have to worry much about there. Um, intercepts, uh, x-intercepts and y-intercepts, um, what we can do is uh, we can set each of the variables equal to zero. So what do I have, x equals zero? And actually, I'll do that in a different color, just in case. So x equals 0. Um, if I were looking at my polynomial, that's plugging in 0 for x. And what happens is all of the polynomial we see, they all have x's in it. So in the end, we're going to get 0. So that tells us that um, 0 comma 0, it's on our graph. And I can plot it right now if I'd like to. But when we set x equal to 0, we were trying to find the y-intercept. But we ended up, when, when you get the origin, it's actually the x-intercept and the y-intercept. So, you know, I guess we got 2 for the price of 1. Now, maybe we want to look for x-intercepts a little bit more. So I'm going to set the other variable equal to 0, y equals 0. So what does that mean? You're setting your entire polynomial, um, which in our case, if I write it out, what is it? Negative 2x to the 6th plus 5x to the 5th plus 140x cubed minus 110x squared. If I set that equal to 0, it's a polynomial I'm going to have to see if I can maybe factor and solve. Um, so I'll go with it. I have an x square. I know I could um, factor out as a GCF. So that should give me negative 2x to the fourth um, plus 5x uh, to the third plus 140x and then minus 110. So right away with this x square part, 
Uh, I already know just by seeing this one. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of look at that. Um, if you set that factor equal to zero, you're going to get x equals zero, and we already had it over here, uh, the zero comma zero. So what we're more concerned about is, you know, how can we break down the remaining polynomial factor? And you can try. Um, sometimes they factor nicely and sometimes they don't. So like a lot of times what I'm noticing is all oh, that, that, you know, I, maybe I can try to take a common factor out of the um, first part. So I can, I can play and say, well, I know they have x cubed. And if I do that, I should get negative 2x plus 5. Um, and then if I look at the other one, the other two terms, factoring by grouping, we haven't done that in a while. You kind of look at it and say, well, uh, I could probably take out maybe a 10. But then if I take out a 10, I get something like 14x minus 11. And then remember the whole goal um, is when you factor by grouping, the whole goal is to get those inner factors to be the same. So uh, factoring by grouping is not going to work. Uh, it, fa it fails us a little bit. So sorry about that. We, we tried. And so um, back in pre-calc, um, you learned, well, we, we could um, maybe if we want to factor that polynomial further, we could do the P over Q or fi we find possible roots um, where we find all the factors of, of uh, 110 over all the factors of negative two. And then we try them synthetic di the division and see if we get um, remainder zero. And then we, that could give us an idea of factorization. Um, but uh, it's kind of up to you to play with. Uh, that may or may not even work, depending on how many factors you have. And I'm already seeing like all the factors of 110. That's going to be a little painful to test them. So this is where we kind of say, well, we always had the TI in our, in our hands. So um, we could. We can look at finding the x-intercepts based on um, our actual graph that we see. Or you could look at the x-intercepts of your um, 2x to the fourth plus 5x cubed plus 140x minus 110. Um, what I would do is maybe kind of look at that one. And um, mainly because sometimes when I graph my, um, my polynomial and my TI, I might not be sure that I have the clear window. Um, this might give me an idea that I do. So uh, I know this really doesn't have much to do other than finding intercepts, but like, we can try it. And I'll do it in green somewhere below. Um, if you guys are looking at the function right now, right now, there we go. We can identify, it looks like, oh yeah, zero, zero looks to be on the graph and there looks to be something that comes a little bit before the number one and maybe something, let me see, one, two, three, four, maybe something around five. It looks like it hits five. Um, so you could try to, to the, uh, calculate the, the zeros on your polynomial at this moment. Um, that's not a big deal, but I just wanna make sure, um, just so that you see, I, I just wanna verify. Because sometimes I'm not sure if my polynomial is, is um, having extra behavior beyond the standard window. So this is where you'll see me um, just checking to that factorization of that other part. And it's up, it's up to you in this case. But So I'm, let's see, I'm going to graph 2x to the fourth plus 5x cubed um, and then plus 140x. And then minus 110. And I'll graph it on the same graph. And you see what happens is that the green part is the actual factorization of the function. It's not the entire function. But it does appear to, um, to cross the, the x-axis at the same point. So that's kind of neat to see. So I'm going to calculate those right now. Um, second trace. I'm um, looking at the zeros and right now it shows me I'm on the original function and I can be there if I want to. I'll just be on my, um, my factorization part just so that we can see. And right now I'm at y equals negative 110. So I'm going to move myself a little up and it tells me where my cursor is. And when I find left bound and right bound, I go above and below. 
And one of the zeros I found, it's not a nice number. It's a 0 0.77, we can, we can round. And then we do the same thing, second case, same thing, two. And then I'm gonna move myself um, on that. I'm gonna put myself on the green function. And then you can kind of see that right now I'm on 2.7 really high. I'm trying to see if I can get my cursor over there. And I could also, um, that's kind of annoying to you. Um, you could also count one, two, three, four. It looks like x equals four is on the left. So you could also just tell it that the left bound is at x equals four. And you could kind of see like, oh yeah, at x equals five. You can use your cursor if you like, but sometimes it saves us time. Not x equals five, excuse me. I'm going to say x equals six because I think that the root is at x equals five. So I'm just going to go after. And then when you press calculate, um, it's tricky. It's not quite a 5. It's 4.925 or 4.93. So that might have been tricky if we were just to eye it with the function. So that gives us a good idea of where our zeros are at. Um, so we can go back. And so from my TI, um, I'll put it over here. From my TI, my extra zeros are my x-intercepts. Um, I got 0 0.77 and let's say 4.93. So kind of if you're, if you're saying, oh yeah, those are the other x-intercepts. Cool. We'll plot them on your graph. And let's do that. We have a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 or so. I mean, 0 0.77 is going to be really close to 1. And then um, 4.93, you know, it's pretty much on the 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So not quite, but it's on the 5. So at least we kind of know where zeros are at. And so that's kind of where um, I'm guessing that this problem probably came from section 3.6 because it seemed like the factorization is a little rough. Um, but we'll see. Okay, so I have a few things going on, the x-intercepts, y-intercepts. Um, I also have my symmetry I'd like to check just in case. Uh, so if we do that for ourselves, uh, remember if you want to check the symmetry, we'd like to plug in a negative x for x everywhere we see it in our polynomial. So if I do that, I'll manually do it just so that we see this. Negative two, and we have a positive five with the uh, x to the fifth, but it, we're going, plugging in that negative x, plus 140 times negative x with a cube, and minus 110 with the x squared, or negative x squared. So we kind of play around and say, okay, I remember when we had uh, negative numbers to even powers, it did not change anything. So it goes back to what we had. Um, but negative numbers to odd powers, it switches the signs. Uh, same story here. But negative number to even power does not change anything. Um, let me make sure I have this 110. There we go x squared. So what you're trying to do is when you're checking symmetry, you're, you're asking yourself, well, um, is it equal to the original function? And that's not true. Nope. Um, then you check, is it equal to the opposite of the original function? And when I look at my original function, I know I wrote it in green up here. Um, it's not the opposite of the original function right away because the first term was the same. So we tried. So at this point, um, we don't wanna say we don't have any symmetry, but we know for sure um, it's not symmetric um, about the y-axis, um, nor is it symmetric about the origin. Um, so we tried, we addressed it. And we probably already guessed it when you were looking at the, the idea of what the graph could have been. It didn't seem to have any symmetry in that sense.
So then we just kind of move on and we say, wait, do we even deal with asymptotes? And we say, no, there's none, mainly because we know it's a polynomial and polynomials don't have asymptotes. So that's good. We'll have to worry about that. Then we kind of go into part E and that's where we take our, our, um, our calculus back into the mix. So um, this is going to help us with our intervals of increase and decrease. Um, I'll write that function one more time, just because if I keep skipping my eyes back and forth, I know I'm going to miss a sign. So I'm just going to repeat this. Uh, I'm, I'm finding uh, negative 2x to the 6 plus 5x to the 5th. and plus 140x to the third minus 110x squared. So that's my original function. And with intervals of increase and decrease, we like to find the first derivative. So I'm going to find f prime x. And it's a polynomial, so I, it's kind of happy in that sense. I should have negative 12x to the fifth plus 25x to the fourth, and then 3 times 140, is that 420x squared, 2 times 110, so it's minus 220x, and then we're going to set that equal to 0. And um, right away, when, when you look at it, um, you can see if it factors, and uh, I have a feeling it's going to give us the same sort of issue as the last time we tried to factor the original polynomial. I do know um, I could factor out an x for sure, um, and I won't even do that because I might cause confusion, but um, I do know for sure that there's going to be x equals zero because there's a common x. Um, that's a possible, the critical point. Um, but the other parts, this might give me an idea that maybe, maybe the TI might give me a better idea of what, what else I can look at. And so I'm interested maybe just having a, a graph of what the um, first derivative looks like, uh, just to give me an idea where um, it crosses the x-axis. So I'll go back to my TI. And now... I'm going to erase my other part. I didn't need y5. That's why I kind of wrote it a little lower. Um, it was just really helpful to, to um, justify what my intercepts were. And I will um, actually graph the first derivative um, as y2. I, I kinda, it's kind of helpful to have them because you can test signs. So let's go that negative 12x to the fifth. Um, plus 25 x to the fourth plus 420 x cubed and minus 220x. And if I were to graph it, let's see. Well, my original number is going to come first, but we'll go from there. And I'm suspicious. And the reason why I'm suspicious is because I'm kind of looking at how many should I have? What's going on? Let's go back. Negative 12x to the fifth plus 25x to the fourth minus four, uh, 420x. Aha! See what I did. I got too many roots, and sometimes when you get too many roots, you want to check what we typed in, and it should have been 420x squared. So yeah, it happens. Type that in. Now try again. Graph it. I should um, erase my blue one. I will in a second. 
Okay, that makes a little more sense now. So what I'll do, and I will maybe I'll zoom out a little bit, just so I can see. I know there's like a high point and a low point. Um, I'm, I'm feeling, I'll adjust my window first. I'm feeling not much is happening outside of zero, so maybe I'll adjust to negative five. Uh, let's just see with the graph a little bit. Gives me an idea of what my, my function's doing. And then it kind of helps me see that there's three, three x-intercepts for my first derivative. And actually, if I can, when I analyze this, um, just so that we don't get confused, because sometimes maybe you don't have different colors when you're graphing. Uh, I'll do that. I'll, I'll unselect my, my um, original function. And then maybe with the window, maybe I'll just make it a little bit higher. You know, maybe, maybe I make my y max, uh, I don't know, let's say 500. Um, sometimes it makes it nicer to see. Um, yeah, a little bit nicer. With that, maybe you should make your y min. Maybe um, I, I'm big on symmetry, so maybe I'll just do that. And it just gives me an idea of what is possibly happening. So I have a feeling at the top of my first derivative, um, there's a max somewhere. And I'm not really concerned at that. I just want to see where the intercepts were. And so I have a pretty good feeling what's happening. So let me graph that really quick. Uh, a, a little sketch for you all. Um, so what I'm seeing at this point um, with my TI, I have a um, quick sketch. And it kind of looks the way the derivative was looking like. It was, it was doing something like this. So when you see that the x equals zero, check. We then have to deal with what is happening. And by the way, just so I'm remembering that this is really what's happening. Ooh, extra there, f prime. And um, actually, what I'd like to do and the reason why I chose to graph it as opposed to um, try to find zeros, I'm going to draw it off to the side with the TI. Um, in a second, you'll see why, because I'm looking for my intervals of increase and decrease. And a lot of times, if I kind of know how the derivative is going, whether it's above the x-axis or below, I'll see the, the increasing and decreasing parts right away. So let me just go back one more time. I want to find those other two values. I want to find what they are. So let's go back. And I'm going to calculate the zeros one more time. And I already know uh, it's crossing at 0, 0. If that's something that you're interested in, in verifying, you can. And actually, I know there's another way to do this, but I'll figure out where I'm at. I want to be close to 1. So here we go. There's also a, a, a simultaneous uh, polynomial um, calculation of zeros on this calculator. Uh, maybe we'll bring that up another time. But right now, um, I have one of the zeros of my derivative to be about 0 0.52. And then the other one. I could have also probably chose it. Uh, a next value. Making sure that cursor is as uh, left bound and right bound. Can't see it, but I do know it's on the right. Um, so I have about 3.99. It looks really close to a four, but it's not quite. Interesting. That's why we can't, I guess, trust our eyes sometimes. Okay, so let's go back. Yeah, no, I'm starting to see, yeah, it's definitely a problem from 3.6. So with the TI, I already knew um, I got zero. Um, that was from, if your function is zero at that point, then your derivative is going to be zero at that point. But the TI gave me the other ones um, where I can approximate about 0 0.52 and the other one maybe um, 3.99. And so those are my critical points. What I want to translate to you all is when you are testing um, the points on each side, remember we're still trying to find the intervals of increase and decrease. 
I always find it helpful to draw a mini number line right below my, my derivative graph and then mark, mark where you see your zeros at. So you have a zero, um, I should probably do that in green. See how this is zero, x equals zero, is separating the number line into two regions. But now you have another zero. That zero happens to be what, 0 0.52? 0 0.52, that happens to be separating the number line now into three different regions. And one more zero, that is um, 3.99 happens to be separating the number line into four different regions. So what I'm trying to determine um, when, I'm, when I'm asking myself, I'm gonna look at F prime. And when you look at what's happening to the right of zero, the F prime is above the X axis. So we played a little bit with this in, I believe it was uh, chapter two, but a lot of times, sometimes things don't sink in. So this is another way to, to kind of look at it. Um, the first derivative is positive. All those y values are positive up until zero. So that's why we can say this. And in between zero and, and 0 0.52, the first derivative is negative. It's below the x-axis. In between 0.52 and 3.99, the first derivative is positive. It's above the x-axis. And after 3.99, the first derivative is negative. It's below. So when you find the signs, you didn't really have to plug anything in. You could actually use the graph to help you. Um, this is giving you information about what's actually happening with F. And so when you play with your intervals of increase and decrease, when the first derivative is positive, you are increasing for your function. So in both cases. So I can actually find where F is increasing. And when you name your intervals of increase and decrease, you're not just making a chart, you're actually writing interval notation. F is increasing from negative infinity to zero. And then the second interval, it's going from 0 0.52 until 3.99. And then where your first derivative is negative, you're decreasing. So we can kind of see, okay. There is a relationship. And so that interval would be from 0 to 0 0.52. And then another one, another interval would be from 3.99 to infinity. So here I'm analyzing actually the graph of the first derivative to tell me about the intervals of increase and decrease for my f. Um, so that's kind of my benefit of why would I graph it. Um, now you can find the first derivative, we had it. If you wanted to, once you found your zeros and you wanted to plug them back into f prime x and test the signs, that's fine too. We already kind of have it in our TI, but that's another way to go. So now that I've found intervals of increase and decrease, what's nice for me is that I can recycle this work to help me find if I have local mins or local maxes. And pretty much every time you see a sign change in the first derivative, that tells you something what's happening at your actual function. So um, I just look at it in all cases, I had sign changes um, at, at x equals zero, at x equals 0.52 and x equals 3.99. So there was, there's all these sign changes. So I will, I will address this um, at x equals zero. Um, you went from increasing to decreasing or the function did. So that tells me the way I'm looking at it is I should have a local max at x equals zero. So what I'd look for, you could say, okay, that's zero. What is f of zero? We already figured out, oh yeah, it's zero comma zero. Now at x equals 0 0.52, okay, it went from decreasing to increasing. And I know it kind of looks like this, so that gives me a heads up that f of 0 0.52 is a local min. 
And I know if I plug in 0 0.52, my job is to find the y value. And I'll do that in a second um, once I figure out um, what's happening with the next one. At x equals 3.99, it goes from increasing to decreasing. So again, we have something like this. So that tells you the function evaluated at 3.99 uh, was going to have a local max. So I know the x value is 3.99. I just need to find that y value. And remember, this is found from the function f of x, not your first derivative. And I'll, I should probably write it in blue so we don't get that confused. So um, this is where I probably use the TI. I mean, I could plug 0.52 in and 3.99 manually, but this might be a good idea to go back to our original function. So we'll do that. Remember, this is Y2 that we have showing up on our TI right now. I would like to go back to my Y equals and um, I'll reselect my Y1 and I'll deselect my Y2. I don't have to, but it just makes it cleaner. Um, no, I'll leave it on. It's up to you. But I can go to the graph and, and find these, but I'd rather go to the table because I'm plugging in values. So I'll go to table, of y1, y2. And so you can plug in x equals zero. Well, y1 was zero, we knew that already. But x equals 0.52. That gives us y1 equals negative 9.91 maybe. And a lot of times when I'm seeing things on my um, Y1, sometimes the cell cuts it off. You could see the full number if you highlight it. And X equals uh, 3.99. My Y equals 4,120. Wow. So here, um, that's kind of significant. Um, I mean, it's a huge number, but it also now tells me that my window should have been a lot higher than 500. So what I'll do, uh, I'm going to copy these numbers over again, and then I'm going to translate them to my graph eventually. Um, but I'll also kind of maybe say, well, this is a great idea. Maybe if we're looking at our Y1 now, our window, if we know that the max, the local max is about 4,000, let's change that and modify that right way. So y max, maybe instead of 4, 500, maybe make it 5,000. Now if I graph, I could start to see like, oh, so pretty. I see most of it. Probably want to see a little more with my function. Um, but just, just kind of stuff to look at. Makes me happy that I have it now. I know if we were in pre-calc, we might spend a long time finding our window. So let's go back and let's, um, let's kind of copy those numbers in. At 0 0.52, it was about negative 9.91. And at 3.99, it was more room. It was 4,000, 4, point, I guess 0.2. I know you could also do two decimals if you'd like. But what's interesting is if you want to go back and say, we can try to plot these. Remember, what are we trying to plot? A local, um, local, local max is zero, zero. So we have that right here. So local max, what would that mean is that you know, your graph is going to um, be, be uh, curving downwards in a sense. So you kind of have like the tip tops or the bottoms of the graph. So we had local maxes, um, I'll kind of, so local max would be zero, zero, and it was also at um, 3.99 and 4,128.2. So 3.99, one, two, three. 3.99 is very, very close to four. So we're kind of staying here. So, you know, we're going to have to rescale this, you know, if we were looking at our, our y axis, uh, obviously, we're not going to count by ones, but the highest point of your graph 
is somewhere over here. I'm just gonna exaggerate a bit. I'm exaggerating a lot and that's a local max. So what's happening is that your function should be facing downwards in a sense at that point. It's like the, 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 the tip part, the, the, the apex, what is it? The apex of your mountain? That's the wrong word, but I hope you know what I mean. Maximums, minimums. Um, other case, local min. So our local min was at um, 0 0.52, negative 9.91. Okay, we, so we see where 0 0.52 would be. Um, it's in, in halfway in between 0 and 1, so it's kind of over here. Now, if you're going to do negative 9.91, um, you, you just kind of, we just kind of designated that's like 4,128.2 was somewhere on this scale. So according to this, if the distance from zero to 4,128 is, is only that far, um, negative 9.91 according to the scale will be very, very low. So you probably would have something really, really close to the um, x-axis. So um, what does that look like? Now I have to kind of modify because my, my local mins and local maxes. So I should have something that has a local min. Uh, it should be facing upwards. So what I'm kind of seeing with my function, um, especially around here, I have it crossing a local max at zero. It's going to be a local min at x equals uh, 0 0.52. And it has to eventually cross through um, my x-intercept, which is 0.77. And if there's no more local mins or local maxes, the only way my graph is supposed to do is it has to come through here a little bit. And it has to come back down. And it has to cross through my other x-intercept. And because we don't have any more local mins or local maxes or any sort of weird behaviors, we go back to our um, idea of the endpoint behavior both facing down, down. It appears to me we have a pretty darn accurate sketch of our graph. So that's great. Um, and it does its job. Uh, that first derivative gave us a heads up but we still have to continue analyzing. We still want to identify if there's concavity and if there's a point of inflection. So let's finish that off. We kind of have our sketch and actually, you know, if you want to go back just because we're, we're interested, why not? Let's look at our graph one more time and see how accurate we are. I'll deselect Y2. Isn't that pretty? We are pretty accurate. And I know you can zoom in around the, uh, the, the interval from zero to one. Um, it, it is a little strange. It's not showing up quite nicely, but if you'd like to. I would like it, maybe you could kind of see that it does have the behavior. I wonder if it'll let me zoom in around 0 0.5. Let me see if I can point it in. Nope. Uh, I don't want to see it there. Come on. Let me zoom back to standard. That might be a little faster to get there. So that's where we didn't have much. But zooming in between zero and one half, that might be kind of So you see in this scale, Right here, because our graph has a scale of uh, tens, uh, negative 10 to positive 10, um, you could kind of see like, oh yeah, it looks like it dips down pretty low. Uh, and so that's what's happening in between zero and one. But when we adjust the window to include our local max, which when we say it was about 5,000, and we're keeping the scales all the same, you kind of see that that's what makes the nine super low. So you can't even see the bottom. So like I said, we can play. You want to make the, the Y min um, symmetric. And this is what I did earlier. 
So you just kind of want to point out that there is a, a sort of a, a loop going on there. So it, it looks like it's flat against uh, the x equals zero to x equals one, but it's, it's, got a, it's got a local min. So that's kind of where the TI fails us a little bit because um, just by graphing it, we wouldn't be able to tell that. So nice question. So let's go back. Um, the last thing we want to um, determine for ourselves is do we have concavity and in points of inflection? Um, so with that, what we'd like to do with concavity is I want to take the second derivative. So I have to look at the first derivative. Um, so if I look at the second derivative, um, I'm going to shrink it down just a little so I can see everything in one screen and be able to calculate it. Uh, right at the top, I've got f prime x. So I'm going to look at f double prime. And we're going to take the first derivative. Uh, well, it's the second derivative of f, but the first derivative of the first derivative. <laughs> That's funny. So negative, let's see, 60, 12 times 5. So negative 60x to the fourth, um, 4 times 25, plus 100x to the third plus two times 420, 840x minus 220. So that is, that is our second derivative. And you could try to set it equal to zero and solve, but you kind of notice it's a, it's a, um, it's a polynomial of degree four. Um, we could try to play around with the factoring, but you know, it just seems like with the, the trend of what our polynomial was doing in the first place, we weren't going to get nice numbers anyways. So this is where you're going to see me go back to the TI, um, just so I can determine the, these intervals. So we're going to use the TI. And remember, we have to go back and forth. And I'm going to plug that into y3. And if I do that, we should have negative 60 x to the fourth plus 100 x cubed uh, plus 840. Ooh, see what happened? 840. Uh, x um, minus 220. Now I know we're in a nice window. Um, I could deselect the function just so that we can purely see what our derivative looks like, second derivative. And now we have an idea of what, what's happening. So there's second derivative there. I'll sketch that really quick just to kind of get the point across. And so what would be happening if I sketch that with my TI? Uh, I'm going to see it does something on the lines, something on the lines of this. That's my second derivative, by the way. And my job is I really care about what are these numbers right here. That's going to give me a heads up of where concavity um, possibly changes in our function. So we go back. There we go. And I will calculate um, those zeros again. So left bound, right bound. So one of them is about 0 0.26, and then the other one, a little faster. Oh, I went too far. Left bound, right bound, and the other one's about 3.05 or so. Okay, let's mark those on our, our findings. Okay, so I should have 0 0.26, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 
and 3.05. And what I do at this point is because I want to test each side of our function, um, what I'd like to do, kind of set up a number line. I have myself looking at 0 0.26 and also 3.05. And if I'm dealing with what's actually happening with the second derivative, the second derivative appears to be negative um, from um, everything to the left of 0 0.26. It's positive um, in between 0 0.26 and 3.05, and it's negative uh, from 3.05 and beyond. So I already know if there's a sign change. Um, interesting. Uh, I'm going to be looking at these two points uh, a little more closely. But the reason why you are calculating signs of your second derivative is so you can tell concavity of your function. So when your second derivative is negative, you're concave down, concave up when your second derivative is positive and concave down. So right away, um, intervals of concavity, your function, uh, we can say it's, um, I'll say concave down first, just in case. Um, we should have negative infinity to 0 0.26. And then we have one more interval from 3.05 to positive infinity and concave up uh, in between uh, 0 0.26 and 3.05. And once we have a sign change going from concave down to concave up or concave up to concave down, right away I know I have inflection points. And the inflection points would be at the function evaluated at 0 0.26 and the function evaluated at um, 3.04. Uh, 3.05, we rounded, right? And so this is where we would have to go in and say, all right, let's go back and, and evaluate it. So let's, let's analyze this a little bit more. Right now I have my second derivative graphed. Um, I'm going to go back and have my first derivative back on screen. And I don't really need my second derivative anymore, unless you want to see. We'll go in the table. So with the table, you see that it has all my first derivative and second derivative. I was interested at what was happening at um, you can repeat yourself. I'm just going in here. Um, 0 0.26. And so my function is negative 4.97. And I also want to know what happens at 3.05. 3.05, not 3.02. And then we'll go back and see. Okay. So we have our two values. So those are the points of inflection. So we'll mark those back on the graph. Being careful, we're kind of ignoring y2 and y3. Okay, so um, f of 0 0.26 is a negative 4.97. And then f at 3.05 is about 2636.2 or so. So now, pretty much done. Um, we can kind of verify what, where, what that looks like on our graph. I just have to have a memory and go backwards. Um, inflection points. We figure it out. That was uh, 0 0.26, negative 4.97, and 3.04, 2636.24. Um, well, it does kind of give you a heads up. It's very hard to see, but um, if you're marking where 3.04 is, it's a little nicer. One, two, three. 3.04 is pretty close to three. So it kind of looks like concavity changes about here. And then also 0 0.26 is going to be super close. It does change around here. So we could kind of tell, okay, yeah, the graph does look concave down 
um, from here to here. It also looks concave down um, from here on out. And then the graph looks concave up from here on out. So you can kind of see where those inflection points break that up. Um, a little rough to tell just by looking at the graph exactly where it changes, uh, but still very interesting. And just one more time so you can see the actual graph. Um, just so that we can verify for ourselves. I will deselect the others. And then we can see. Oh, I might have deselected the, the last one. And yeah, you can kind of see the concavity as well. So that's analyzing that polynomial, um, something that's not quite still straightforward. Uh, we're going to look at uh, another example, um, two more in this section. And you can kind of see these take some time, so that's why we don't have so many that we're looking at um, in the homework. But I'd like to kind of approach some of the ones that tend to give us a little more trouble. There'll be some nice straightforward ones. But just remember, Moral of the story, um, there are things you can definitely tell by looking at your calculator and, and finding on your calculator, but we're gonna be using calculus to kind of um, prove why we have this. So make sure that work is included when you're working on homework and um, exams. Okay, so moving on to example two, um, what we end up having is we're using the guidelines again to sketch um, f of x equals negative x over x squared minus 1. And so right away when I look at it, I, I automatically remember that it's a rational function. It's a rational function. And there are some things I already know with rational functions, so I, I definitely don't have a problem with um, reminding myself rational functions are undefined. Uh, and maybe that could help us out um, with the domain in a second. But they are undefined when the denominator is equal to zero. And so a lot of times with rational functions, a lot of people like to see if any of them factor. And this one that happens to factor. We have x plus 1, x minus 1, difference of squares there. And so we know um, the values that make our denominator zero, x would not be allowed to be a negative one or it would not be allowed to be a positive one because you would be undefined. So that can't be anywhere in the graph. But what does that tell you? Um, from our previous knowledge, the lines x equals negative one and x equals um, positive one, those are vertical asymptotes, VA. So uh, at least that kind of tells me that, yeah, I can plot them. Those are some definitely some nice characteristics on the graph. So might as well do that now. And then I'll prove it later because I know it asked for us to do that with calculus. So with the vertical asymptotes, remember those are vertical lines. So it's kind of separating our, our um, x-axis up into, mm, what, three different regions at this point. Okay, so at least I have that. And again, I'll go back and prove it in a second. But what this tells me, it gives me the heads up of my domain. And f of x is defined for everywhere except for those two values. So if you're going to, you can say it in English, all real numbers except for negative one and positive one. But when you write it, formally interval notation, you'd be coming from negative infinity to negative one. That's where this is. And then you can't choose negative one. So there's like a little hole there. We're gonna go from negative one to positive one. That's where this is. And then the last one from one to infinity. So we have our domain. So um, just kind of move a little forward with intercepts. We're going to see, um, I set each variable equal to zero. So I just start off. What happens when x equals zero? Uh, if x equals zero, I should have um, f of zero. Wasn't that negative zero over zero squared minus one, which is zero over negative one, which is zero. 
So I'm getting um, zero comma zero. I can mark that right away. Happens to be X intercept and Y intercept. Um, I know when we let X equal zero, it's the Y intercept, but um, that's true. It just happened to be the X intercept at the same time. And now if you let Y equal zero, um, the way it looks like, let me kind of help you out with this. Um, F of X, that's equal to our negative X over X squared minus one. If that's set equal to zero, that's e equal to zero when your numerator is equal to zero. So that's just telling you when negative X equals zero. Well, what does that tell you? When X equals zero, ah, it's the same thing. So our x-intercept and y-intercept, uh, there's only one possibility. We had one, and it's at 0, 0. Now, sometimes that's not the case. You may see later um, we don't have that, but that tends to be common a lot. OK, so pretty good. Um, we did plot what we thought our x-intercept was. Uh, I'm going to look at symmetry. So let's look at um, f of negative x. And I'm using the original function as opposed to the factored form for now. So f of negative x. Um, there's a negative sign that's already there. And we're plugging in negative x everywhere we see x. Make it a little prettier. So what we ended up doing, I know it's not equal to the original function because it is missing a sign, but it's really close. It's the opposite of the original function. So that's telling us that our original function is odd. And it also tells us information that it's symmetric about the origin. And yeah, we can't see it right now. I can graph it, I suppose. Um, yeah, we could. But let's just do this without and see what happens, see what we get. We'll have to eventually graph it pretty soon. So um, again, with the asymptotes, um, we already knew this. Um, I have the vertical asymptotes, x equals 1 and x equals negative 1. And what I'd like to do is I want to make sure that I'm proving it using calculus. So I'm verifying this. So when you prove these using calculus, um, what we want to do is take the limits as x is approaching these numbers. And what I like to do, and, and this may help out, um, you may not need it in this particular class, but it, it does really help me in Calc 2 when I'm doing um, some of these um, limit calculations and graph. Um, I say limits of integrals. You'll see that later. Um, I do kind of like to show what's happening and I do a little, a quick little mini sketch around that point. So first things first, if I'm looking at um, x equals one, so it's the first one I'm going to look at. I'm going to take the limit from the left. So if I take the limit as x approaches one from the left side, of my function, and again, my function was negative x over x squared minus 1. Okay, let's look at what we're dealing with right here. Um, let's draw a quick little sketch. And I'll do this, I'm trying to see how I can organize it. Um, I'll do this off to the side. I'll do it right here. I may need a little more paper though, so forgive me. I may be going um, a little more to the right. So again, I'm looking at positive one, and positive one is located right here. Now, if you're approaching from the left, and we're gonna do this intuitively, um, you're just picking a number that's really, really, really close to one. And a number that's really, really close to 1 would be maybe 0 0.99 or 0 0.999. And so intuitively, if I'm proving this, I'm not going to switch up on us. There we go. I can kind of do a direct substitution based 
on a number that's really, really close to one. So when I do a direct substitution, I'm plugging in about 0.99 to my function. So then when I do this, 0.99 square minus one, uh, what you'd like to do is, um, you don't have to get crazy. Uh, I just wanna compare the numerator and denominator and I'm kind of using my, my PI to help me. So for example, um, you know, negative 0 0.99, still negative 0 0.99. Um, what I'm trying to see if the denominator is positive or negative, and I also am interested in seeing if it's small or, or a number that's really close to 0.99 or 1. So I'll just punch in. Um, you don't have to see this, but I'm, I'm squaring 0.99, and I'm subtracting off uh, 1. So what I just got is negative... 0 0.0199. So what I'm looking at, uh, negative divided by negative, first of all, is positive. That's kind of something to, to kind of keep in mind. But I want to kind of point out that I have a number um, that's pretty close to 1, okay, 0.99, but it's over a very small number. So that's kind of my justification of whenever you are looking at a number divided by a very, very, very small number, it ends up being a very, very large number. And very, very large number, we kind of say, oh, yeah, that's infinity. Okay, so that's my intuitive idea of what I'm thinking about. And that's kind of, uh, I should probably put approximation. So what is happening as x is approaching 1 from the left side, it appears that you'll have something like a vertical asymptote shooting upwards to positive infinity, a little rational function there. Now we can do the same thing on the other side. What is happening as x is approaching 1 from the positive side? And then that's, again, we're still looking at our function. And if we were to kind of think to ourselves, well, what kind of number would that be? Um, wouldn't be kind of, we look at a number that's a little bit higher than 1. Maybe we have 1.01 .01 or 1.001. Um, I'm being a little bit nicer because I don't have to write so many decimals, but I can go a little crazier if you'd like. Um, so if I were to plug this in, um, we end up having... Um, negative 1.01 .01 over 1.01 1 .01 squared minus 1. And so what you're trying to do, so negative 1.01, .01, you could find the value, but you're trying to understand, is this going to be a really small number on the bottom or really or, or a large number or something that's close to 1? 1.01 1 .01 squared minus 1, um, 0 0.02. 201 and it happens to be positive so negative divided by positive is negative and now you, what we're dealing with and I should have a little approximation symbols you end up having one over another relatively small number so what does that give us negative infinity so as the function is approaching um, one from the other side what happens is our graph is shooting down to negative infinity. So we kind of have an idea of what's supposed to happen at the asymptote there. Now you could do the same thing, and we could. Let's do it because we have video. You can fast forward if you get this. And if, if you're not seeing it, because maybe I picked the numbers to um, maybe, I mean, 0.99 is still relatively um, far away from one if, if we're speaking about um, supposedly getting really close. Um, let's go crazier this time. Uh, look at the negative one part. And then we could try to pick maybe using um, a number that's a little further away. Well, I would say further away from 0.99, but very, very, very close to one. It gets tricky in the language. So what I'm going to look at again, and I'll kind of I'll kind of draw this right here. Again, here we're now looking at what's happening at negative one. Now, if we're picking a number, 
that's coming from the left, that's going to be the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left of our function. Uh, a good number might be, okay, when we're coming from the left and we're speaking with negative numbers, I might say something like negative 1.001. You want to go crazier, 1.0001. So if you think about what's happening to your function, you have a negative number, negative 1.001. This might make it come back to us. Negative 1.001 square minus 1. Okay, so now the top becomes 1.001 positive. Um, the denominator, want to make sure, what do you have? 1.001 square minus 1. We are now getting a relatively small, a lot smaller. Okay, so the idea is we got positive. And you're kind of thinking, well, it's a number close to 1, really close to 1. And it's over a very small number. And if it's one over a small number, you got infinity happening. So what's supposed to happen as you're approaching negative one from the left, your graph should be shooting upwards um, around that vertical asymptote. So as long as we keep getting infinities, when we're calculating these limits, we know we have vertical asymptotes, but I wanna make sure from the other side as well the limit as x approaches um, negative 1 from the positive side. Again, we're going with our function. And you're thinking about what number should I choose? That's a number that's really close, but maybe I'll say negative 9, uh, 0.999 instead of 0.99. That kind of makes it solidifies it. So now if we're thinking about it, we have negative 0 0.999 over negative 0 0.999 square minus 1. So we have a negative number. And I'm just trying to understand what's happening on the denominator. If I say 0 0.999 square and then I subtract off 1, I'm getting a negative number and I'm also getting a very, very small number. So what does that tell me? And let me make sure. Well, I guess you're, yeah. Did I forget? Ah, I know what's supposed to happen. Okay. This is what happens in calculus when we've been working too long. You see how it was negative x? Well, if I'm plugging in a negative number, I got to be careful. The opposite of a negative is a positive. So in the end, we should get negative. And now you have, let's make sure, you have something cr pretty close to 1 over a small number. So one over a very small number, pretty close to negative infinity. And <laughs> you may see a little bit, um, a lot of times when you start plugging in um, the x and you notice that it makes the denominator zero, so you start to see a little bit of a shortcut of, oh yeah, anytime I see one over zero, I'm getting infinity in some sense. Um, and, and for the most part, that's true. Uh, I just like for you to inspect it a little bit closer in this case because you have to care about whether it's positive infinity or negative infinity. And purposes of proving that it's a vertical asymptote, all you have to do is get infinity. But if you're analyzing a graph, it's really cool to see what your y values are approaching because it gives you a heads up of where they're shooting to, positive infinity or negative infinity. And I'll verify that on the graph as well. And if you want to do that now, I just can't wait. Um, let's graph it really quick, just so that you guys can see. Sometimes you nod your head and you're like, yeah, whatever. But um, it's very helpful. I'm going to clear out our previous work. Just making sure you guys all see that I am sharing the right picture. Yes, the TI. Okay. So if I'm going to type in negative x over x squared minus 1, I just need to make sure that my denominator is completely in parentheses. Otherwise, it will give me a different function. And let's zoom it to standard, because I don't think there is anything happening. Look how beautiful. So, so again, if you're looking 
at the function and you're kind of saying, I think it's so beautiful, I will copy and paste it. Okay, so let's go back, back to our graph. And I think it's so wonderful that I'll copy and paste it right by where I'm supposed to graph it. See if we can make it larger so you all can see it. Oh, it's so nice. Well, not that large, geez. Sometimes, sometimes it goes a little crazy there, okay. Now we have a picture. And obviously the TI, super cool. TI gave us a really accurate picture. But you guys can see, we can see the, the X equals um, negative one vertical asymptote. <coughs> Excuse me. The X equals positive one vertical asymptote. And again, check it out. As X is approaching negative one from the left, look what the Y values are doing. They are shooting up to positive infinity. As X is approaching negative one for the right, the Y values are shooting down to negative infinity. Again, look at this. See how we have an accuracy on our quick little sketch of when we were trying to understand what was happening. So nice. And similarly, the other way around, if X is approaching positive one from the negative side, the graph was shooting up to infinity. And if it was approaching from the positive side, the graph is shooting down to negative infinity. And again, look at what we have. It's very similar to the behavior of the function around that point. This is kind of the nice part of analyzing. Again, it's sufficient to get uh, infinity to show that you have a vertical asymptote. But if you want to know the behavior of where it's going to, it's really nice to, to kind of understand how do I know if it's positive or negative infinity? And it really solidifies why the graph looks the way it looks. <coughs> Excuse me. So excited. So that, I mean, we pretty much have our sketch and that's great. But remember, um, we still have to verify another thing with asymptotes. We just talked about the vertical asymptote. Um, when I'm looking at my graph, it kind of appears that the function itself is leveling off um, on the far edges. Um, so I want to make sure before I go there, um, I want to look for one more thing. I want to look for a horizontal asymptote. And if you're playing with finding a horizontal asymptote, um, a little bit of math um, from our past. Um, here, here I, I can even just look at our function. F of X equals negative X over X squared minus one. Now, um, a little bit of shortcuts from college algebra pre-calculus. They used to tell us, hey, if your degree of your numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, then the horizontal asymptote is always Y equals zero. And yeah, you can nod your head and say, sure, but we want to prove it. Prove it using calculus. And what that would mean is the definition of a horizontal asymptote would be Let's take the limit. Let's take the limit as X approaches um, positive infinity of your function, negative X over X squared minus one. And so what you're looking at, by the way, is you're trying to say, hey, what's happening at the far edges? X is approaching positive infinity. Uh, and it looks to be like the, the graph is leveling off. So what you can do, um, this is where, remember we have limits at infinity. Whoops, I'm supposed to highlight that. Um, previous section gave us some justifications, some shortcuts. We can call on Bill Gates. Um, I should probably say uh, dominant term analysis. That's probably more um, proper. But you can say that that's the same as the limit of negative x over x squared. All we're doing is taking the, the leading term, dominance. And then you can do a little simplifying. Limit as x approaches infinity. Well, that's negative x over uh, one over x squared, isn't it? One over x. 
And whenever you have one over infinity, intuitively you have negative one over a huge number. Now, this is the other way around. When we were looking at our vertical asymptotes, we have um, one over a small number, so it makes it a big number. If you say one over a huge number, that's like getting a really, really, really small fraction, really, really, really small decimal, which is really essentially just zero. So right away, you got your limit as x approaches zero to be a constant c, which is zero. That's why we have our y equals zero. Now, by the way, um, what's the purposes of, of kind of analyzing this a little further? It's telling you that it's a negative fraction. Well, check it out. If you look at the far edges, it's telling you that your graph is below, below the x-axis because a negative fraction would be slightly below zero. So that's kind of helpful. And also, you want to go the other way, prove it. The limit as x approaches negative infinity of your function uh, by the same ideas, if I can. I want to do this a little nicer. Um, we end up getting this. Um, we still can use the Bill Gates principle or dominant term analysis. The limit as x approaches negative infinity, negative x over x squared, limit as x approaches negative infinity of negative one over x. Okay, and then now let's just look at this a little bit carefully. Um, still got negative one. But when you plug in negative infinity for x, you have negative huge number. Okay, so what happens? You have one over a huge number, um, which essentially is still zero. And that's proving that there should be a horizontal asymptote. It's the same thing. But it also gives you behavior of what's happening at negative infinity. So the long-term behavior, again, if you're going, if you're going this way, what's your graph doing? Your graph is approaching the y values. They're positive. They're very, very close to zero, but they're positive numbers. So it's, it's kind of giving you a little more information when you use limits. So try to, to, to reason through that and be able to prove that so that you can justify where these asymptotes are. And of course, the shortcuts from pre-calculus and college algebra are great. Uh, just be able to reason that you can, you can calculate these through the limits. So now, generally, if you're kind of thinking, well, what about oblique asymptotes or, or the slant ones? Um, the minute you find a horizontal asymptote, you're not going to find a, a slant asymptote. Um, mainly because slant asymptotes, they have to be one degree higher in the numerator than in the denominator. So once you find a horizontal asymptote, you're good to go. Maybe we'll see a slant asymptote in the next example. Yeah. Okay. So uh, last few parts. This is where the calculus, a little bit of review of, of uh, the beginning of chapter three. We're going to have to talk about the intervals of increase and decrease. And now you already have the graph in front of you. You can probably guess what's happening, but we have to be clear and justify this. So let's do this. Um, first off, let's remember that our function, original function was negative x over x squared minus y. Uh, now I know I'm taking a derivative. So I'm going to have to find the first derivative. Now here's the issue. Um, I have a rational function. And so when you take the first derivative, remember there's, there's the idea of there's a formula involved. We have the gf prime minus fg prime over g squared. So it involves you naming everyone. Um, so the f is always the top function. The f prime, you can find the derivative. Uh, the g, what do we have g as the denominator x squared minus one, so g prime is two x. <coughs> Excuse me, a lot of talking today. 
So now if we plug everyone in, if we plug everyone in, we end up, we've got a G, that is X squared minus one on top, gets multiplied by F prime, which is a negative one, Still subtracting off the f, which is a negative x, and multiplying that by the g prime, which is a 2x. And that's all over g squared. So that's x squared minus 1, and then we're squaring that according to our formula. So what we want to do for ourselves is clean this up where we do anything really. Um, I should get, uh, if I'm distributing the negative one through, what negative x squared plus one, then I should have a positive two x squared. Well, that's not as bad as I thought it was gonna be. Okay, still writing the denominator over. Combine like terms in the numerator, we should have x squared plus one over x squared minus one squared. Okay. Now, the reason we did this is because we want to find critical numbers. Um, there's two things we have to think about. Um, you can set it equal to zero or you can decide when it's undefined. So little notes to yourself. Um, F prime X is zero when your numerator is equal to zero. And who's our numerator? X squared plus one equals zero. But um, if you try to solve this, um, you can. Um, don't you remember how you get um, plus or minus, what is it, square root, square root, a negative one? You get the plus or minus i. See how you have no real solution here. So um, we can't really use that in, in our work for critical numbers. But there's another case. Um, your derivative is undefined. Um, when your denominator is equal to zero. So we have another case. But when we do that, what does that give us? X squared minus one equals zero, X squared equals one, X equals plus or minus one. And no, yeah, those are great numbers, but you have to remember, they have to be in the domain of F in order for you to be a critical number. What was happening at X equals plus and minus one? Darn it, those are the vertical asymptotes. So they're not in your original function to begin with, so they're not critical numbers. So um, these are not in the domain. They're still helpful in helping you uh, see um, the intervals of increase and decrease because you still have to address them. Uh, but the fact that we couldn't find critical numbers so no critical points. Um, that tells us that we have no extrema. So we already have the answer to part F, but we had to prove that. And we still have to address intervals of increase and decrease just because we have no um, local mins and local maxes. We still have to go through this. So at least I'm getting one thing out of the way. So let's look at this a little carefully. I'm gonna have a little sketch off to the side. Um, now remember, I'm kind of referring everything to F prime. So let me see if I can circle this or something to, to make it stand out. So if I do a quick sketch, I probably have to write a little bit more. Um, you're trying to understand what's happening at F prime. And there were no critical numbers, but you do have to deal with what's happening with um, the undefined numbers from the domain. Okay, so let's do this together. We have F prime. Now, what we wanna do is charge the computer, there we go. Um, we are looking at trying to deal with the sign of the first derivative. Well, my friends, let's look at the sign of the first derivative. Um, 
C, see the numerator x squared plus one? It is always positive, no matter what we do. For whatever value of x we plug in, not gonna matter. Similarly, x squared plus one, or excuse me, x squared minus one square is always gonna be positive as well, because no matter what you get, you are going to have to square it, and squares always end up being positive. So f prime, positive divided by positive, is always going to be positive all the way through. So there's no increase to decrease or anything like that. We actually just have behavior of the function the entire th way through. f is increasing everywhere except for at the points where it's undefined. So the only thing that you can address with part e um, you have to de de determine that the intervals of increase are, is pretty much the, the domain. So you could say, oh yeah, that's negative infinity to negative one in union with negative one to one in union with one to infinity. So that's the only thing we have to kind of address. And again, let's look back at the original graph. Check it out. I never drew it, huh? I should probably draw it. Make us feel better that I can sketch too. There we go. Well, look at what's happening with your function. Um, for every x value, as you move from left to right, its corresponding y value is going to be bigger than the previous y value. So that's why we're increasing everywhere. But we're increasing everywhere except for where we're undefined, which is why we had to break up the interval into three different pieces. So that's kind of a heads up. <coughs> Excuse me. Stuff that, that doesn't always be obvious when you're looking at it. And we're almost there. We got to address if there's concavity or points of inflection. And a lot of times um, that's not always obvious from the graph. Uh, so um, we do this by taking the second derivative. And so what I'd like to do again is remind ourselves that we had our um, f prime x already. We found that it was x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 1 squared. And again, yeah, it's a, it's a quotient, so we do need to deal with it. So what do we have? Um, g f prime minus f g prime over g square when we're ever trying to find that second derivative. Sorry, but um, it's not that bad. Good exercise for us. So let's remind ourselves. Um, if I were dealing with the formula, my, my numerator x4 plus 1 is f. So if I take the first derivative, it's just a 2x. Now my denominator is x squared minus 1 squared. And if you want to, you can multiply it out and then take the derivative, or we can use the chain rule. g prime is 2 times x squared minus 1 to the first power, but we have to multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 2x. <laughs> now clean it up. Oh, we have 4x times x squared minus 1. And if you want to, it might be nice to 4x cubed. Is that what it is? Do I want to do that? No, I'm going to wait. Um, my reasoning, because I've done 5 million of these, is that when I see x squared minus one's around, sometimes there may be like, um, there may be reasonings for factoring them out to make life easier. So uh, take my advice, we'll see. All right, so let's do this. Let us, let us plug in our formula. First of all, g. g is x squared minus one squared times f prime, which is 2x. I'm going to subtract off f, which is x squared plus 1, and multiply that by g prime, which g prime is 4x times x squared minus 1. And that is all over uh, g. x squared minus 1 squared, but it's squared. g squared. And here's kind of what I was trying to think about earlier. 
Um, I'm going to want to simplify this. And yes, I can multiply stuff out. Foiling is not too bad, <laughs> but I kind of like the fact that I see an x squared minus 1 in two places. I also see a, an x in two places. And that's going to help me if I factor stuff out. So what I like to kind of show off is um, if I were to take out the 2x um, and, uh, from the 2x and the 4x, there's a GCF. I'm pulling that out. So here I'm looking at this and this. So I can take out a 2x. The other thing I'm looking for is I could pull out an x squared minus 1. Because I see that show up in, in both of the terms. Now when I do that, I have to be careful. When you take a 2x out of the first group, um, there's no more 2x left, but there is an x squared minus 1 because we only took out one of them. There's still a minus sign. And we never took out an x squared plus one. That was already there. And we only took out a two from the four, two x from the four x, so we should have a two left over. And we already took out an x squared minus 1, so there's no more x squared minus 1 inside. So I just have to be careful. Um, still in the denominator, what is x squared minus 1 squared squared? That's x squared minus 1 to the fourth. Okay. So now, almost there. Notice in the numerator, there's an x squared minus 1 factor. And there's an x squared minus 1 factor in the denominator, which would divide out, and you'd be left with just three of those factors. So that's kind of nice. So that'll give me, at least a little bit, 2x. Now if I um, maybe play around a little bit, I have x squared minus 1. Um, I can distribute the 2. So it's going to be negative 2x squared minus 2. I mean, I'm feeling a little bit better. Okay. So 2x, take our time, x squared minus 2x squared is negative x squared. Uh, negative 1 minus 2, negative 3. And we still have x squared minus 1 cubed. If you're interested, kind of up to you, um, you could pull out the negative sign from the negative x squared minus 3 if that helps. Um, it's kind of up to you. I mean, either one of these is okay. Now remember, this is f double prime x. And this is the same reasoning we're going to have to go through again as we did up here. Is we want to find out, are there any places where it's zero? Are there any places where it's undefined? So a little note for ourselves. Mm. Okay, so f double prime x equals zero when our numerator equals zero. Okay, so what do we get here? Um, we get negative 2x equals zero, um, or x squared plus 3 equals zero. So this gives us x equals zero. That's a nice number. Um, but you guys want to solve this one again? That's a sum of squares. If you try to solve it, you're not going to get a real solution. You're going to get i's again. Square roots of square root of three i or something like that. So we're gonna we're gonna deal with this in a second. That's a possible possible um, possible inflection point. We'll see. The other thing you want to double check: um, where are you undefined? And it's undefined when the denominator is equal to zero. That's x squared minus one cubed equals zero. But if you check it out again, if you were to solve this, um, what do you get? x squared minus one equals zero, x squared equals one. And that's fine. You get x equals plus or minus one. But uh, don't you remember not in domain? It's 
still nice to test signs, but it can't be a possible inflection point. So the very last thing we do is test the signs because we want to see if x equals zero is an inflection point. So we have to verify this. So when I do this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this over here so you guys can see. Um, again, I'm looking at my f um, prime, double prime. And what I'm looking for, uh, there's a few points I have to deal with. I have to deal with what's happening at x equals zero. And then these negative ones and positive ones are there because they are the domain. So we're still testing everyone on each side. So we're going to understand this. <clears throat> F double prime. Um, you're, if you're testing signs, um, what I like to try to understand for myself is that there are three different factors going on. So there's negative 2x, there's an x squared plus 3, and there's an x squared minus 1 cubed. And so what I'm kind of looking at is the sign of each factor, which gives you the sign of the entire second derivative. So um, what I'll be setting up for myself, bear with me here, I will be setting up a series of signs um, in each case. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to point out is that pink factor x squared plus 3 is always positive, no matter what you choose. So this is why you see me have a positive sign for that pink factor. Now, the teal factor, the negative 2x, is going to depend on what test point you use, whether that's going to be positive or negative. So if I pick something to the left of negative 1, uh, negative 10, negative 2 times negative 10, I get a positive number. Okay, so that's my teal factor. And so I'm going to try to find that version of what's happening to that teal factor with these numbers. If you pick something in between 0 and negative 1, maybe negative 1 half, you're still going to get a positive factor for the negative 2x. And then when you look at between 0 and 1, you are going to get a, what, 2 times, um, neg 2 times positive 1 half ends up being negative. And then what's after the 1? 2 times 5, negative 2 times 5 is going to be negative as well. So see where I'm getting the signs of each, each factor. Now similarly, the denominator, that's the last thing I'm going to look at, is I'm going to say, okay, well, if I pick anything uh, for x squared, I have to be careful. So if x squared, let's see, x, x is negative 3. Um, that's going to be 9 minus 1. Um, but when you cube a positive number, you still get a positive number back. So I'm getting a positive denominator. If you want to pick it this way, what happens in between 0 and negative 1? That is um, negative 1 half square minus 1. So what happens is you get a negative number to the third power. And when you take a negative number to an odd power, you get a negative number back. Same situation with if you pick a positive 1 half in there. And then you're probably guessing, well, I think uh, if you pick a 2 or a 3, that denominator, that purple factor, it has to be positive you're going to get a positive before you cube it. So that is true. And you can verify them. Just sometimes it's nicer to just break it up by signs instead of trying to plug it into the entire function. So now what you do is you, you're saying, OK, well, what is the, the ultimate sign? Um, you're multiplying these three factors together. Um, that means f prime, uh, excuse me, f double prime is positive, negative, positive, negative. So finally, we have the sign of the entire um, second derivative, which now is going to tell us about the original function, whether it's concave up or concave down. So if the second derivative is positive, you are concave up. If your second derivative is negative, you're concave down. 
So now we have our intervals of concavity and also this x equals zero, there's a sign change between concave down, concave up. So we know for sure we've got an inflection point. So right away, I can point that out if I need to. Inflection point at f of zero. And remember f of zero was equal to zero. So if you want to go back and plot it really quick, he was already there and oh, that doesn't make sense. It does look like it's concave down to concave up. Okay. Go back one more. And then the last thing we have to deal with is just talk about our intervals of concavity. So um, this is what you're addressing, concavity. Um, F is concave, F is uh, concave up CU um, from negative infinity to negative one. And then it's also concave up again from zero to one. And it's concave down the other intervals, uh, negative one to zero. And um, the other interval is one to infinity. So that's what we're, we're finally addressing. And then if you go back and look at what you thought was the graph, yeah, making sense. Concave up, what is it? Concave up from negative infinity to negative one, also concave up from zero to one. And then you could see, oh yeah, it does look concave down on the other intervals. You look at them carefully. Pretty neat, huh? So it's kind of hard that I think this would be one where you nest, you don't really need a calculator to help you. Um, probably with all the information we could have sketched it without uh, and then if you're ever desperate you can always pick a lot of va x values and plug them in and then you can find the pattern of what your function's doing. But it's really interesting how you can use the, the calculus to analyze. So, um, I, if this were a lecture class, I'd probably stop and have you guys try this one on your own. But um, you're here for the video. Might as well give you some, some things to play with. So one more. And I know these take relatively long, so um, that's why I don't think there's as many in the homework. But let's, let's finish off this one, and I think you'll have enough tools to help you get through 3.5 and 3.6. So let's go back example three. Um, right away, what's, what is standing out to me? I'm gonna erase um, previous work on the side, there we go. I already see right away that F is rational. It's a rational function. So um, I could kind of say, well, uh, I, I already can kind of play with when it's undefined and defined but I would like to maybe factor it first and see if anything happens. Um, we tried that earlier. Um, I know I can tell the denominator, but I saw that the, the numerator looks a little more complicated. So that's the first thing I'll try and play with. Let's factor f of x. Um, what's kind of nice is the numerator, there's a GCF of x that you can pull out. That leaves us with x squared minus x minus two. Denominator is a difference of squares, x plus 2x minus 2. And the other nice thing about um, what I see in the numerator is that it's a special trinomial that factors down even further. So that's nice. I think that's a x minus 2 times x plus 1. Double check. Sometimes you switch the signs and everything else is off. Still over x plus 2x minus 2. And then there's a couple things here. Remember, we're undefined where our denominators are zero, but we wanna be careful because this one, if we're not paying attention, we notice that the x minus twos divide out. And that's an indication, that's gonna tell us that there's a hole in the function. And it's the whole at x minus 2 equals 0 or x equals 2. So right away for the domain, I know x is not allowed to be a 2 because there's a hole. But if you didn't pay attention, 
and you just rewrote your entire function without paying attention to that first, you'll miss that. Now we have an alternate version of our, um, of our particular function. And also, what I kind of want to look at is our, um, the x plus 2 gives us an issue. Um, it's going to give us a heads up that there's a vertical asymptote as well. There's a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2. So right away we know x can't e be positive 2 or negative 2. And we could have verified that at the beginning but it helps us understand why. So I can draw the vertical asymptote in if, if you'd like right away. Was it um, at negative two? My, my apologies, so I'll do that right away. And the whole is gonna be at positive two, but uh, you have to kind of know what your function's doing before you, um, I guess, before you can draw it in. I don't know where my function is right now, so I'm not sure where to draw the hole, but just remember, there's a hole. We'll, we'll have to kind of go back and, and add that in later. So now if you're going to, to play with this, maybe before we, we go into this, we're going to have to maybe I think I can almost name my domain, but I, I'm a little bit concerned, um, and I'll tell you why in a second. So let, let's go back and check. Um, just by knowing where my asymptote and my hole is, I can name almost all of my domain, but I, I'm seeing something right away. Um, see how the degree of the numerator is one degree higher than the degree of the denominator. That's kind of giving me a heads up that there's a slant asymptote coming into the picture. And slant asymptotes are lines that might have an x-intercept, so I want to be careful before I name my entire domain. So right away, um, we'll come back. See how you can't always do these in order. But I'll get there, don't worry. So um, let's look for our intercepts. And what's kind of nice with our intercepts is, um, you know, after you're kind of naming the fact that you can't have certain values based on your domain, we already know x is not allowed to be 2, and x is not allowed to be um, negative 2. We should be okay. Okay. x intercept. x equals 0. So that would be the y-intercept. Let's check out. That's us calculating f of 0. We can do this in our nice format. That's going to give us 0 over 2, which is 0. Wow, well, again. So do you see that you get that order pair 0, 0, which is it's your y-intercept, but it's also x-intercept 2. So we do know, at least, that our, our line is going through here. curve is going through 0, 0. OK, so let's do y equals 0. Now, when y equals 0, you're getting your f of x, your y equals 0, which is what, x times x plus 1 over x plus 2 equaling 0. And whenever fractions are 0, it means that the numerators are 0. We've been playing with this for a while. So that's going to give us x equals 0 or x equals negative 1 and we already found we already found the x equals 0 part we did that earlier that's this one but x equals negative 1 is also a, the x intercept so let's let's draw that in it's right here And now I'm a little, I'm a little more confident now, just kind of seeing where my function is that um, I can kind of now tell that I can probably name my domain without even dealing with the slant asymptote, but I'll show you why um, 
we'll graph it and then we'll go from there. Okay, so symmetry. Uh, just want to verify um, what's happening with your function. And if you'd like, uh, you want to plug it into the, um, the more simplified version, which can be fine. Either way, f of negative x, um, it's negative x times negative x plus 1 over negative x plus 2. And sometimes, you know, maybe if you want to multiply it through, it might be a little nicer to see what it looks like. There's nothing we can really do. Negative x squared minus x over negative x plus 2. Now compare. Um, f of x, at least our simplified version, was what x times x plus 1 over x plus 2. Well, that's equal to x squared plus x over x plus 2. And you're like, okay, well, it kind of looks almost the same. I know for sure it's not quite the same. If I play around with factoring out negatives, sometimes that saves me some issues. So we can try. So I'm getting this part to be the same. Um, but it's still not quite the same as the denominator. Um, I can play around. And also factor a negative one out of the denominator. But now I'm not quite getting the original function back, nor am I getting the opposite of the original function. So right away, I, I know that I'm not equal to the original function, and I'm not equal to the opposite of the, the original function. So I don't really have an even and odd um, thing I can address. So that, that tells me no symmetry about y-axis or origin. And if you'd like, I mean, we didn't take your TI away from you. You could probably see. We can graph it and you can tell in a second or so. Okay, so let's play with the asymptotes. Um, we, we kind of already figured out that there was a vertical asymptote. Um, and we, we already knew it was at x equals negative 2. Let's verify it using limits. So remember, with the vertical asymptote, the way I'm always dealing with it is I look at where negative 2 is, and I say, OK, what's happening if I approach from the left? So the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left of our function. And for our function, I'm going to use our simplified version, um, because we're not going to be around the hole anyway. So. Our simplified version was x times x plus 1 over x plus 2. And we can do the same arguments. Um, if you're approaching negative 2 from the left side, that would be like an idea where you're saying it's negative 2.001 or something like that. And so if you are playing with it, you can say, OK, well, um, negative 2.001 times negative 2.001 plus 1, negative 2.001 plus 2. You just go through and try to understand, do I get a negative number or a positive number? And like, am I getting small numbers in the numerator or denominator? What's going on? So just to help you out, you do a little calculators. Um, negative 2.001 uh, plus 1 is negative 1.001. And then if we look at the denominator, negative 2.001 plus 2, we end up having negative 0.001. So right away you know um, you're going to get negative. Now the issue is, what, what are we going to get? The numerator is pretty close, so I will do, I will do approximation symbol. The numerator is pretty close to the number 2, and the denominator is a very small number. So when you get 2 over a small number, that ends up being very large. So that's going to be negative infinity. So that's, that's um, 
that's verifying you do have a vertical asymptote for sure. And even though the behavior of the function is that it's shooting down to negative infinity around um, x equals negative two. So that's nice. Now approach it from the other side. The limit as x approaches negative two from the positive side, if we're doing that, we might say, oh, that's like saying negative 1.999. Or if you wanna be a little bit less decimal, you could say 1.99. Um, more decimals, the, the more um, you can justify that you're getting a small number or a big number. And we're still looking at the same function. And intuitively, we're plugging in um, negative 1.99, negative 1.99 plus one, negative 1.99 plus 2. And we're just trying to see signs. Now, if you say negative 1.99 plus 1, you're getting negative 0 0.99. Negative 1.99 plus 2, you get a positive 0 0.01. So now you can kind of analyze and say, OK, uh, I know the sign is going to be positive. And I am getting a number still pretty darn close to 2. Uh, and it's a small number. So 2 over a small number is going to be positive infinity. So you can kind of see, oh, the graph around uh, negative 2, if you're approaching from the positive side, it's going to shoot up to positive infinity. So at least that gives us some information. And we have verified we have the vertical asymptote. We're good to go there. Check. Um, now we're going to check for horizontal asymptote. And um, as I uh, was saying earlier, I kind of was like a heads up. I was thinking, if you look at the original function, the degree of the numerator is one degree higher than the degree of the denominator. That's a heads up that a slant asymptote is going to happen. So a horizontal asymptote most likely won't be there. But I want to prove it to you to make sure. And this is the beauty of, of having things and not maybe having them memorized. You can use limits to test. So the question is, do we have a horizontal asymptote? Well, check. Check from either side. Is the limit as x approaches infinity of your function, and we'll just use the re reduced version, um, do we, are we going to get a nice constant? It doesn't even have to be a nice constant. Are we going to get a constant in general? So um, by Bill Gates, invoking dominant term analysis. That's the same thing as the limit as x approaches infinity of x squared over x, which if you reduce it, limit as x approaches infinity of x, and if you were actually doing substitution, you get infinity. Now this is different, be careful. Um, this is not a real number, so that already tells us that there's no HA. If it were a constant, we would be having that. So. That's kind of the verification. And you don't have to show it from both sides. If you already know there's not one, it, it's going to be the same behavior from the other side. So this is where I was um, trying to say, I have, a, I have a feeling there's a slanted asymptote. Uh, are they called oblique? And so remember, um, our f of x, just so that you guys see that, it was what, x times x plus 1 over x plus 2? Or if you were to multiply it out, x squared plus x over x plus 2. Uh, with the slanted asymptote, they prefer that you look at um, what does the graph look like in terms of um, dividing. So you can use division. And when you divide, you're saying, what's x plus 2 going into x squared plus x? And that one works. You can do long division. Um, I also know when my um, monomial or my uh, my divisor is a is a nice binomial where it's it's linear um, i can also use synthetic division so sometimes you'll see me jump to that i mean i'm not a big fan of long division you have to end up using it eventually in calculus too but go with it see what happens uh, if you use synthetic division you're using the opposite of the divisor and you're writing out your coefficients of your terms in descending order. I attached a zero because I have no constant. And then synthetic division allows you to drop down 
So we should get um, whatever you get in the uh, bottom of the line. We say one times negative two goes above the line. We should get a negative one. Negative one times negative two gives a positive two, and that's going to give us our remainder. So that is another format of what f of x is. So f of x is giving us x minus 1 plus 2 over the divisor x plus 2. And sometimes um, this idea of dividing, I mean, you might not care right now, but it does make integrating easier if you don't have a, a, a fraction, if you have kind of a nicer separation of terms. What is integration? Uh, I can't wait. We'll see in chapter 4. But um, what I want to pay attention to is if now, if you take the limit as x approaches infinity of your f of x, um, you're taking the limit of this side. It's the same thing. Um, it's the x minus 1 um, plus 2 over x plus 2. And just so that you guys can see, um, we're not really caring about the x part. It's really about the um, quotient. I should be a little bit more, um, I should be a little bit more precise. Um, it's really taking it with understanding what's happening here. So as um, we're going through this, what happens to this term? And if x is approaching infinity, this term gets really big. And so when you have something that gets really big in the denominator, this entire term ends up being really small, which means it's essentially 0. So what you end up getting, and I'm going to ignore this for a second. Here we go. You end up getting um, f of x equals x minus 1. And my friends, that's y equals x minus 1, the equation of your slant asymptote. So if we have that, let's draw that guy in. y equals x minus 1. Oops, I went too far. Come on. OK, so slant asymptote, y equals x minus 1. So I have a y-intercept at negative 1, okay. and then the slope is positive 1, so up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, keep going. And so we can use a straight edge for our slant asymptote. Notice I didn't really mark them with points because I wanted to see what was happening. That was ugly. Hold on. A little too shaky there. I wanted to make it a little nicer. I'm trying to use a dotted line to help myself. Sometimes it's a little harder when I have my crayon. OK, so that is my slant asymptote. And now we're, we're OK. Now I can kind of judge myself better for the domain. And I counted wrong. On the whole part, I'm sorry. What we're saying, the whole was supposed to be at x equals 2. Um, did I mark 1? I wish you guys were around to let me know. There should be a whole at 2, not 1. I mean, it, it's still the same, but I just marked it wrong on the graph. Now I can finally address my domain. Um, the slant asymptote is still good to go. It doesn't hurt anything in my problem. So that, that makes me happy. Um, it, the slant asymptote goes through x equals um, positive 1, but I do know that there's behavior of the graph around there, so it's still possible to have a value. So let's, let's now officially write the domain in. So the domain is coming from negative infinity to negative 2. Um, let me write it a little lower so I don't run into my graph. Negative infinity to negative 2. Um, in union with negative 2 to positive 2, in union with 2 to infinity. 
I feel a little bit better now that my slant asymptote is on the graph and I kind of know uh, there's nothing that's going to happen with those x values. Yes, okay. Okay, so we've got the asymptotes taken care of. Um, now it's time for intervals of increase and decrease. And yes, we still get a little more practice with our, with our um, quotients and that's okay. Might as well makes us memorize everything. So uh, to simplify the process, um, yes, you could use your original function, but we kind of have been utilizing, oh, what do I keep going too far? We've been utilizing our reduced version of the function, mainly because it makes life easier with a lot of the math. Um, as long as you're paying attention to where the hole is and what the, the, the domain is, you should be okay. So, I will remind myself that I am basing everything off of f of x equals um, x squared plus x over x plus 2 with the caution that x is not allowed to be positive 2 because there's a hole there and x is not allowed to be negative 2 because that's where the vertical asymptote is. So if I end up getting critical numbers that, that run into that, then I have to be aware of that. If you don't want to worry about what's in the domain, what's not in the domain, then you probably have to do the derivative based on the more complicated version of the function. We'll see how this goes. So we're going to look at um, the first derivative. That's f prime x. Keeping in mind, um, if we're doing this, uh, what is that? g f prime? Um, yep, g f prime minus fg prime over g squared. So I'll write that in just in case. gf prime minus fg prime over g squared, just so that you know what to plug in. And now we go through and start naming everyone. Uh, again, with our function, f is equal to x squared plus x. That gives us f prime, which is 2x plus 1. Our g was x plus 2, so that g prime is 1. So now when you start plugging everyone in, g is x plus 2, f prime is 2x plus 1, there's a minus sign from the formula, f is x squared plus x, and g prime is 1. Well, that's nice. At least that. Let's make that a little prettier. Don't forget g squared, so that's x plus 2. And don't forget that there's a square happening. Okay, so now we can simplify a little bit. Uh, I don't see anything special to do any factoring out. So well, it just looks like it's a FOIL uh, distribution. Um, x plus 2 times 2x plus 1. We should have 2x squared plus x. Um, let's see, it should be plus 4x. There we go. Plus 4x plus 2. Now when I distribute the negative one, um, we should have minus x squared minus x. And then the x plus two square, I don't tend to like to multiply it out. We'll see if it, if it worries us later. Um, we'll do like terms. We have x squared plus four x plus two. Good. And still all over x plus two squared. Now I'd be excited, I got a trinomial at the end, but that trinomial doesn't seem to factor nicely. Yeah. Okay, so then we just go through our whole idea. Well, we've got a rational expression. Uh, so we know that the first derivative is zero when it's numerator zero. That's x squared plus four x plus two equals zero. Um, and that's a nice uh, quadratic equation. You, you can use the quadratic formula if you'd like. Uh, I might just go to my calculator since it's a little bit faster. I've been, I have a lot of computations already I've done. I'll get there. Um, F prime X is undefined when the denominator equals zero, but that gave us a uh, negative two. And remember that was not in domain in the first place. So right away, that's not, that's not eligible to be a critical number. 
So we're going to go into working. Um, I maybe need more paper, but um, I'm looking at this um, x squared plus 4x plus 2. And I will use my TI to help me out a little bit on that. Um, so let's pull that up. That's probably why we, we combine these two sections. So I've got my x squared. Just make sure I'm getting the right function down x squared plus 4x plus 2. Graph it real quick. Nice parabola. Calculate your zeros. So that's not too bad. We've been doing that a lot. So left bound, right bound, and we get one of them. It's about negative 3.41. Calculate your other zero. A little bit further, left bound, not that far. Left bound and right bound. That's our other zero, negative uh, 0.59 or so. So I'll mark that kind of in my graph so I can tell. Um, so if you guys can see, I graph my derivative, something like this. And the points that I was caring about is negative 3.41. And what was that one? Negative 0 0.59. And let me move my writing over a little bit. Uh, I guess I'll erase it. Just remembering that we couldn't use that, not eligible. Okay. So again, remember, this is the graph of your derivative. So if you're thinking about what's happening, a lot of times you'll see me plot everything down to the number line. If I have negative 3.41 and then also negative 0.59, now this is going to help me about my intervals of increase and decrease. Um, right away with my f, it's positive before 3.41. Four, one, negative 3.41, it's negative in between the two numbers and it's positive after. So that gives me a nice idea of what's happening with my function. It's increasing on the two edges and decreasing in between those two points. Um, now, um, what does that tell me? My intervals of increase and decrease. So increase, we can now name negative infinity to negative 3.41 in union with negative 0 0.59 to infinity, and it's decreasing um, in between the two numbers, negative 3.41 and negative 0 0.59. So we have the answer to that. We're addressing that part right there. In addition, we can see that there's a sign change um, at the, both of those points. Um, at negative 3.41, um, we went from increasing to decreasing and then decreasing to increasing at negative 0 0.59. So those critical values um, are going to tell us about our local mins and local maxes. So just kind of a heads up, um, when x is equal to negative 3.41, we went from increasing to decreasing. So remember, increasing to decreasing tells us that f of negative 3.41 is going to be a local max. And if we want to find those values, um, we can, and we will in a second. Negative 3.41, I need to find whatever that value is. I'll, I'll be back. And x equals negative 0 0.59. f went from decreasing to increasing. So that tells me the function evaluated at negative 0 0.59 is going to be a local min. So my job is to find what those values are to fully address that and write that in on my graph. 
So I guess my function's not too bad, but might as well, might as well start incorporating my graph into the mix. You might have done that already. Let's share that with you again. Um, now I really have no use for my, my uh, first derivative. I'll erase it out and I'll type in my graph. And I don't have to, but I will write in the, the original function, uh, mainly because it takes care of asymptotes and holes just in case. So you, you could have, you could go with the modified function as long as you're paying attention to what's going on with um, some of the, the domain in your graph. So I have x squared, x cubed minus x squared minus 2x. So right away, the original f divided by x squared minus 4. Make sure uh, numerator is completely in parentheses. And then the denominator is completely in parentheses. x cubed minus x squared minus 2x over x squared minus 4. Just double checking. And then we can go to our table. And we want to define the value at negative 3.41, not 14. Where did I get that from? And negative 0 0.59. So that helps us see our two values. OK, so we'll keep, take a mental snapshot, write that in, and address it. So at negative 3.41, we got about negative 5.8. And at negative um, 0 0.59, we got maybe 0 0.2, negative 0 0.2. And so I've addressed those. Um, what I would probably do is just go back to the graph and see if I can plot them just to help me. So little notes to myself, local, local max, um, negative 3.41, uh, negative 5.8. So what does that look like? Uh, it's a little bit right here. It's negative 3.4 about um, negative 5.8. One, two, three, one, two, three, four, and five. Somewhere over here. So that's a local max. 5.8, well, let's count again. One, two, three, four, five. 5. 5.8 should be probably about, probably about here. So looks like we're gonna have a local max right there. So you can kind of think, okay, something's going on that way. And local min, that's negative 0.59. Or I think it was negative 0 0.6 if we round. Um, and then negative 0 0.2. Now, if we were doing this, that's right in between our two x-intercepts. Somewhere a little over here. And 0.2 is really close, so that's where we'll have our local min. So right away, you're kind of saying, OK, along with that, let's even, let's even go further. Um, remember our asymptotic behavior uh, around x equals negative 2 coming from the right side, the positive side? There's a couple things going on. We had um, approaching positive infinity and negative infinity. So if you're coming from the right side, um, on one of them, if I'm coming from the right, that means I'm, I'm part of this function. I should be shooting up here. Uh, maybe I should do that in purple. So you guys can see that this is the part of the function that's coming from the right. Now, if you're coming from the left, that's the other part of the branch. You're doing this. Isn't that interesting? You can get a good idea of what's happening. And I'm guessing, it looks like there's curving going on. So there's uh, that and then the slant asymptote probably is going to justify the rest of my function doing something like this. Um, and then we could check it if we want. Let's see. And once we got those local maxes and local mins in, like I think we're pretty good to go. Um, but I know there's one more thing to analyze just in case. So let's go back. Let me graph it for you. 
Oh, how about we just graph it and look how look how close we are. Pretty nice. So um, yeah, once I found those local mins and local maxes, and I knew the behavior of the function um, at the asymptotes, then like that's a really accurate sketch. And I could go in and plug more numbers in, but I have a good idea of the behavior now. Now remember, it's not always about getting the sketch, it's about being able to justify like why it looks the way it looks. Uh, there's one more part to look at. We are almost there. And we are looking at concavity and points of inflection to see if there's anything that's giving us um, more information. So if I can, Remember that I calculated my first derivative. I know concavity inflection point has to do with second derivatives at x squared plus 4x plus 2. That's over x plus 2 squared. So I need to calculate my second derivative. So f double prime of x. Um, that is also going to be a, a quotient again. So that's the whole gf prime minus fg prime over g square. And that would be kind of where we start saying, okay, let's name everyone. Um, f is equal to the numerator, x squared plus 4x plus 2. So f prime is 2x plus 4. <clears throat> g is the denominator, x plus 2 squared. And so that g prime would be 2 times x plus 2, but there's no chain, it's times 1. What is that, 2 times x plus 2? Um, I could distribute through, but I, I do kind of, I do kind of see some interesting stuff happening. In fact, um, some, some of the tricks with the factoring could help me too. So g f prime, g is x plus 2 squared, f prime is 2x plus 4. I have a minus sign from the formula. f is a little longer, x squared uh, plus 4x plus 2, and g prime is 2 times x plus 2. I guess it could also be 2x plus 4, whatever you would like. Um, let me kind of play with it as we go. Don't forget g squared. Um, that's x plus 2 squared. Oh, let's, let's color code that. So x plus 2 squared, but don't forget it's the square of that. So there's a couple of things I could play with. Um, I see x plus 2 in the denominator. And let me clean it up just a little bit. I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, So the denominator, for sure, x plus 2 to the fourth. No problem there. I'm seeing a few things happening, um, mainly I know I could play a little bit more with simplifying, but I do see that there's an x plus 2 in each of these terms, for sure. So you could pull out an x plus 2. So that would leave us with an x plus 2 left over. There's still a 2x plus 4, and actually, if you were inclined to, um, I mean, it won't matter, but I could, I could call this, I don't know if you're excited about this, I could call this part 2 times x plus 2, and give me further justification of why I can factor out another 2. I don't know if that's getting confusing, though. Um, feel free either way. Um, like I can do that, but I don't want you to get confused with exponents and, and factors. Let me see if I can. I'll rewrite it so it's a little prettier. Just I'm slowly erasing so I don't erase everything. Let me erase this part. 2x plus 4 is the same 
as 2 times x plus 2. So actually what that allows me to do, it gives me another common factor to factor out. I mean, may or may not be exciting to you, or, or I don't know if you want to go that far, but that's true. We could take out a 2 from here. So again, the 2 comes from the turquoise part, and the x plus 2 comes from the cell part. So now my friends, be careful, because if you took an x plus two, there was three of them, so there should be two of them left behind. And I, did I just make it harder? We'll see. If we now take the rest of it, and we already pulled out two x plus two, we'd still be subtracting off the x squared plus 4x plus 2. I don't know. I don't know if I just made it harder or easier. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Sometimes I will go from there. So I mean you still have a 2 times x plus 2. What does make my life a little nicer, at least personally, is I see, I see the x plus 2's dividing out, but only one of them. So that's x plus q cubed. Mm, so maybe. I'll write that in for you. X plus 2 cubed in the denominator. I mean, so I still have a 2 on the outside. Okay, now on the inside. Um, if I square X plus 2, that's X squared plus 4X plus 4. Subtract off X squared minus 4X minus 2. So I can, I can then kind of neutralize a few things. So perhaps a little nicer. What do we end up having? Four. Four minus two. Oh, yes. Sorry, sometimes it's, it's, the, uh, it's the, the simple math that kind of just throws me off. Okay, so I have a 2 on the outside. What's left? 4 minus 2 is a 2. Still got x plus 2 cubed. All right, so in the end, 4 over x plus 2 cubed. I guess that's a little prettier. Okay. I, there might be another way to go, too. But what was my purpose? Again. Why are we doing this? Because we want to see if there's intervals of concavity. Now remember, um, we're looking for potential inflection points as well. So uh, what we would be dealing with is your second derivative. Um, it's never going to be equal to zero. Uh, numerator never has a variable in it, so we're good. Um, F uh, second f double prime x is going to be undefined if denominator equals zero, which also gives us x plus two uh, equals zero or x equals negative two. Ah, but remember already this is not in domain. So what we still have to worry about is that we still have to deal with, okay, there's probably no inflection points. It's good to know. One last thing. One last thing is us dealing with our mm -hmm. F prime, double prime, I should say, mm -hmm. and plugging in points. And this one's not going to be so bad. Now, just remember here, um, what we have to adjust for, and this is something that you're, this is why it's a little tricky. Um, we didn't find any possible inflection points, but everyone that's breaking up the domain has to give us some information. So remember those, the, the value where you had a hole and the value where you had a vertical asymptote is going to help us out. So if I'm looking at my signs of my second derivative, 
The numerator is always four to begin with, so it's positive on the top no matter what. It's the denominator that's going to give us an issue. So um, if I'm plugging in um, something that's beyond negative two, like um, negative 10, I'm going to get a negative number to a power of three, still negative. If I plug in something in between negative two and positive two, I get a positive and something after two, I get a positive. So again, uh, all I'm looking at is what's happening in the denominator. So that tells me what's happening with F in the long run. F, I should say the second derivative. What am I doing? It's negative. Let's make it prettier. There we go. So it's negative, positive, positive. Finally, finally we have behavior of F concave down, concave up, concave up. So there's no, um, I know there could be an idea of um, you guys saying, oh, but wait, I thought there was a change in concavity. That's why I wanted to show this one. Like you're like, wait, I know it goes from concave down to concave up at negative two, but the issue happens is that you, can, you it's impossible to be an inflection point if you're not in the domain. Like you, you're not, you're part of the asymptote, so you're not really showing up. So please be careful with that. So the last thing with the concavity, just so that you're trying to um, address it, um, F is concave down from negative infinity to negative two, and it's concave up um, negative two to two in union with to to infinity and let's let's address this on the graph one last time and we're almost there you are hanging in there you're doing really nice um so let's kind of make sure concave down concave down from negative infinity to negative two i went too far here we go so we're concave down from negative infinity to negative two yeah that makes sense okay concave up there's two pieces from negative two to two and from two to infinity yes that is the case and remember how why two is the issue right here it's a hole so concave up the graph um whoops i should probably give you this um, negative two to positive two, it is concave up. We can see that that's the behavior of the graph and still two to infinity also concave up. So finally, we can put our pens down, take a breath. Um, it looks like we've analyzed this function as much as possible. So hopefully these three examples, um, even though they were lengthy, they kind of give you everything you need to approach the problems in both of these sections. Um, Thanks for hanging in there. I, I will see you the next section.